Hello, it's Tom Donald from the London Contemporary School of Piano. Today I'm going to talk about a topic I'm very passionate about, and it's a topic I think you need to all know a little bit more about, and that's improvising in classical music. Improvising in a classical style. Today's video, I'm just going to break down ways and methods of improvising in, let's say, the classical period style, the classical period of Mozart, Haydn, around that period. Um, and I'm going to make some more videos in the future um, about improvising in the Romantic period style as well. Now, um, so you should subscribe to our channel and uh, get those updates. So what we're going to talk about today before we start, uh, many of you might think that it's a little bit odd to improvise in classical music. Um, you're not meant to do it or you're not meant, supposed to do it. Well, I'm going to tell you something that might be uh, quite revealing to a lot of you. Improvisation plays a huge role in the development of classical music history and it is somewhat over the last 100, 200 so years has been slowly, I will even use the word as strongly as sterilized out of the musical culture. And there are reasons for it. Um, and I won't go into a whole big history lecture about it, don't worry. But it's important that you know some of the basic reasons why this has happened. When you go back to the Baroque period, every musician, every composer, um, ensemble player was a very knowledgeable improviser. You just had to be to be a professional musician. And it was quite commonplace for the keyboard player, the harpsichord player, to play of something that is like a lead sheet that is what we called a figured bass line, just a bass line that is notated and the keyboard player has to work out the chords and the combinations that go with it. No different, funnily enough, to playing in a rock band today or in a jazz group today. So where did it all disappear in classical music? Even you go as far as Mozart, his piano cadenzas, most of them he never actually notated. The cadenzas you hear in Mozart piano concertos today have been written by another composer because Mozart would just simply improvise them. So it was a very uh, ordinary, normal thing for even the extraordinary players like Mozart to do and all of the musical culture around it. Improvisation was not seen as, seen as some new thing or some odd thing to do in classical music. But what happened in the Romantic period, very slowly and surely, it was about the rise of the composer and uh, it was the first time where composers could really earn an amazing livelihood from music which is obviously a wonderful thing I'm all in support of that and it was the written notated score that really helped the composer uh, preach the message of their music and get their music out there to other musicians to play it through the guidance of fully notated music and as the publishing companies really uh, collaborated with the composers to, to get the music out there to the rest of the world very, very slowly, we started reaching this new paradigm where the composer and the performer became two completely different things and branched off in their own direction. And that is why today, most, even some of the best classical pianists in the world don't really or cannot or have no training in improvisation. So I advocate being a bit old fashioned and bringing that back. Yes, improvisation is not something new. And uh, by bringing that back, we have so much joy we can bring to the music. We don't have to live in this world where we simply obey a score, like it's the words of God or something. I don't know. Like it, it doesn't always make sense. And so much of this music was composed through improvisation as well. When I started digging deeper into classical improvisation, I realized how similar it is to even improvising on the blues, as far as the procedures and the ways we practice it go. So it's really quite fascinating that these genres of music that are supposed to have nothing to do with each other are actually very closely related. So I'm really excited to get started with you. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at a lead sheet, a classical lead sheet. Let's dig in and have a look at this. So if you've never seen a lead sheet before, you should check out our YouTube channel. We have really good video training on how to play off lead sheets in pop music and in jazz. But here it is in classical music. And guess what? It's pretty much the same concept. Music is built from chords. These chords I put together though are particularly idiomatic 
to classical chord progression writing, particularly of the time of Haydn and Mozart, let's say. And traditionally, Haydn and Mozart and Bach and all these composers would express these chord patterns in their own lead sheets. They actually used lead sheets back in those days, but the difference was those lead sheets were often written in Roman numerals, so you could basically change it into any key. And by the way, we have a special classical progressions chord pack. So if you head on over to our website, contemporaryschoolofpiano.com, and let our team know that you've watched this video, we'll send it to you. We've got these progressions in a whole bunch of different keys for you to practice it. So you've got some really good resources by your fingertips. So let's have a look at these chords. And if you've ever come across what we call these slash chords, that's what we call it in popular music um, or in versions. This is where the bass note is different to the chord that you're playing. So for instance, you know, we've got C major, G major with a B in the bass, F major with an A in the bass. So the first thing we're going to do is we're now going to learn a little pattern for the left hand. No different to our blues videos, but this is a classical pattern. And the name of this pattern is called an Alberti bass. And you hear it a lot in Haydn and Mozart, and it sounds and looks like this. I'm going to play an Alberti bass on a C major chord. Let me do this with the left hand. It's amazing how that reminds me of some of our blues shuffles we've been doing in the left hand. It's amazing how so many different styles of music are still so connected to each other. So here's our Alberti bass. And this is the way we're going to express the chords in the left hand. So then we've got a G major starting on a B. So before we continue going through this progression any further, let's just practice playing those two chords in the left hand. Just to get the left hand into the groove, the classical groove. Okay, now let's add some C major notes into the right hand for some improvisation. And for those of you who are newer to playing this idiom and style of music, you're going to still find there's coordination issues just to get your hands working together. So we might just play this Alberti bass and start just by improvising and playing around with the first five notes of a C major scale. today. Okay, so that's a good starting point to get your fingers warmed up, but obviously we'll want to move through some more chords. So let's play this chord progression nice and slowly. F major, C major, F major, C major, D minor, G major. So I'm playing the chords like this but I'm turning them into an Alberti bass. Now the Alberti bass. line of this progression. Okay, let's make a melody up in the right hand now. Do that again. And of course, you can modify those chords in the left hand. This is just a starting point. So what was I doing in the right hand? Well, what happens in melodic improvisation, it's no different to what happens in jazz or in any style of music, classical music, is that a composer doesn't just write scales. We don't just spend all day listening to scales. We tend to, in repertoire, see scales moved around and played in different positions and, and starting on different notes inside the scale to make either short motives, melodies. 
sequences. So a sequence is where you play, let's say, a series of three or four notes. And you just move that sequence up or down the keyboard. And that can be a useful way to build a phrase. What you're looking to do when you're improvising against this left hand is to keep it simple and use these little short motives and leave gaps and phrases. Phrases are really important in classical music. Classical music has a certain sense of symmetry to its melody. Well, this is before the Romantic period anyway. It has a sense of symmetry to the melody so that you have one melody and then a second melody that replies to that. So you could do something like this. So that's the first bar. Second bar. And I use the same melody. I use the same rhythm, but I modified the notes. And I can do the same thing in this bar. Now I could do something instead a little bit more adventurous or maybe something a little bit more ornamented and moves a bit faster. Now let's go to the second line. In the second line I use chords that change key and move into the dominant key, a very typical classical music uh, idiom. And you hear this so often in Haydn and Mozart. So I've got a C major chord. Then I go to a D major chord, but with the C in the bass. Moves to a G major chord with the B in the bass. A minor with a C in the bass. G in the, with a D in the bass. And then the D7. And then the G major. And then the G7. So now if I'm going to improvise on this second bar, I'm slowly moving into the key of G major as, as soon as this second chord in fact. So I'm going to replace all of my F naturals with F sharps. I don't just start playing a G major scale because that sort of gives the game away. I sl slowly creep it into the music a bit like this. And now let's see the fingers. So it's quite fun. I'm starting to feel like I'm improvising something like a piano sonata, which is really, really enjoyable. So the next step is let's now move to another key. So in classical music, the key changes are very function driven, you know, moving to the dominant C major to G major. And now we're going to move to the relative minor. And let's perhaps change the groove for the relative minor. Let's change it to just some block chords. A minor, E major, E7 over a G sharp, A minor, D minor, G7, C major, F major. I put in a B half diminished here, and then a B7, then an E suspended fourth to an E major. So I'm using some more advanced chords here. But for those of you who understand what these chords are, you can voice them in different ways as well. You don't have to voice it just the way I played it. But even just by looking for your own voicings with these lovely triad clean harmonies is so useful for your piano improvisation and functional piano skills. So here I'm putting the seventh in the bass, which works quite well. So we're going to start with the first two bars of this A minor section. I'm 
just going to start with the first five notes of an A minor scale. I might move up to the sixth note as well because that is a lovely semitone to play with as well. And I might just improvise between those first two bars just to get started on something. So I'm going to hover between A minor and E major chord here. That's a, that's a lovely classical phrase, by the way. I'll think of something else, maybe another invention around that chord progression. was a more scale-like invention. Okay, now I'll improvise something to that entire second part of the progression, starting on the A minor. That chromaticism was almost a bit blues-like. I almost felt like I was going to start doing this. I've obviously clearly been teaching too much blues recently. So let's try that again, that second phrase. tension by repeating those suspended chords. Then I've got the D minor over the F here, and then I go to the G7. And I'm going to improvise a little cadenza now. So what is a cadenza? A cadenza is often like a linking pattern. Not only it's a big solo section in a piano concerto where the piano really gets to show off, it's often just a linking passage that takes us back to the first phrase. So on that G7, that final G7 here, I'm going to improvise on a G7 chord with passing notes to create a cadenza. And the great thing about a cadenza is you're gifted with a sense of free rhythm. It's often many moments in cadenzas are unbarred and there's a sense of uh, color voce to the rhythm which gives you a free expression of the rhythm. So let's move into the cadenza from those last three bars there from the E major. Then back to the beginning. Let's play the whole progression now. So I hope today's video has given you some really good tips to exploring this new horizon. And please click the subscribe button because I'm going to be putting more videos and training together on classical improvisation because we should restore this lost art. We need to bring it back. 
uh, to bring more pleasure, enjoyment and holistic, most importantly, holistic understanding of music back into our training, which is what we do at the London Contemporary School of Piano. So head on over to our website, contemporaryschoolofpiano.com and ask for the free classical music pack which has these uh, progressions written down in a number of different keys. These lead sheets, just tell the staff of our team through the email address on our website that you've seen this video. And they'll, they'll often need one or two days to get back to you, but they'll get back to you with this pack. And um, I look forward to speaking with you soon on these topics and uh, enjoy your practice. Thank you very much. My improvised piano concerts come from no preconception or plan at all. The music is there, I just have to trust it. And that's the hardest thing that I've had to learn on this journey.